What a privilege it is to be in church with all you folks this morning. One scripture in your hearing before we're seated. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. This is the last book the Apostle Paul will ever write on this planet. And he writes to his young friend and son in the gospel and young protege, Timothy. And here's what he says to this young pastor. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Somebody say, nevertheless. It's not a word we use all the time. Unless you're a lawyer or a politician, or you're just really, really smart. But most of us aren't sitting over our Happy Meal saying, nevertheless, the chicken McNuggets. But I want to talk to you this morning about nevertheless. Would you lift up your hands one more time and ask God to speak to you personally? If you'd give him an invitation, he will do it. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for this service. I ask you to speak. I ask you to touch and change lives, minister to hearts, uh, change destinies, alter eternities this morning. We'll give you thanks and we'll give you praise because we dare to pray it in the name that is above every name. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. And you may be seated. The dictionary basically defines nevertheless by using its synonyms. If you look up a dictionary definition of nevertheless, you'll see nonetheless, notwithstanding, regardless, even so. Be that as it may, or that being said, or how be it, or however, or in spite of that. That's how the dictionary defines nevertheless. Nevertheless implies a concession or an admission. It's something that you're right, that shouldn't be forgotten, but that doesn't affect the conclusion. Nevertheless, imply statements which, although they may be literally true, they're actually a little bit misleading when you look at the big picture. For example, well, pastor, my friend said that St. John is the capital of New Brunswick. Well, that may be absolutely true. Your friend may have said that. Nevertheless, Fredericton is the capital of New Brunswick. So just because the first statement is true, your friend did say that, it doesn't lessen the truth. And, and it's actually a little misleading when you say, my friend said, because we don't know your friend. Nevertheless, is a word bridge. It connects two ideas. The first idea, even though it's true, even if it's factual, has no power to lessen the greater truth of the second idea. I don't believe you own a minivan. Well, that's true. You may not believe that. Nevertheless, my car is parked in the parking lot. So the first idea has no power to lessen the truth of the second. In Paul's case, when he writes to Timothy, if you follow down through the chapter, he's saying a couple of guys uh, in particular in the New Testament, Hymenaeus and Philetus, these two men that have gotten into false doctrine, he said, Timothy, they've strayed from the truth and they're spreading the poison of false doctrine and they've shaken some people's faith. And it's not looking good, Timothy. Nevertheless, in spite of the fact that some people have messed up, in spite of the fact that some people have walked away, in spite of the fact that some people are teaching or preaching false doctrine and they're letting the poison of that false doctrine lead them down a wrong path in their life, in spite of the fact that a few people have given up and looked around and walked back and, and left God, in spite of that, nevertheless, the foundation of God is still standing sure, Timothy. You don't have to worry about that. It's going to be fine. See, nevertheless, builds a, a firewall between truth. It's true that they were messing up. It's true there was false doctrine. It, 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 it builds a firewall between that truth and the greater truth. You could say it builds a firewall between fact and faith because faith is always greater than fact. They're not the same. Nevertheless, says that, that may be so. It may be exactly what you've said. But just because you said it and you think it and it, just because that may be happening, that utterly lacks the strength to erode the greater truth that I know. 
And the greater truth that I know is that in spite of whatever is happening in this world, the foundation of God is still standing sure and strong this morning. Nevertheless, is the most efficient weapon you have to any argument. Uh, it, it's an incredible answer because the devil or anybody else can state whatever facts they want, but if you've got faith in God, that faith is unassailable. It's not assailed just by mere facts. Uh, people talk about facts as though they're, um, uh, you know, totally unassailable. You, you can't do anything about it. That's just the facts. And, and so that's why right now in uh, a country that's quite close to us geographically, uh, they've coined a couple of phrases, you know, and one of them is uh, fake news. Has anybody heard that phrase in the last little while? Fake news. So, so now we've got three or four alternate universes going on all at the same time. Uh, your news isn't the same as my news and your fact isn't the same as my fact and I see it this way and you see it that way. There's something greater than everybody's collection of random facts and that's faith in the word of God. And you'll need this word nevertheless once in a while in your life. The words wolves in sheep's clothing didn't originate with a late night comic or a sharp-witted politician. It didn't even come from an ancient philosopher. The, the words were wolves in sheep's clothing actually came from Jesus because Jesus knew that the enemies of truth sometimes run in packs. He said this in Matthew 7, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And uh, Paul anticipated an onslaught of liberalism against the infant church. He anticipated that there would be false brethren. He anticipated that people would teach false things in the name of Jesus. And he anticipated that sometimes they'd be armed with personality and education and charisma and intellect and they would say false things and people would believe it just because they liked the teacher or the preacher. But Paul knew that mostly they wouldn't be armed just with their personality and their intellect. They'd be armed with ravenous appetites and they'd try to devour defenseless Christians. In Acts 20, he warned the church, 20, 29, and 30, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise and they'll speak perverse things and they'll try to draw disciples away after themselves. Paul saw that coming. He warned the church. He said, there's going to be some people that talk a lot about Jesus, but they don't really live for him. They talk a lot about God and the Bible, but they're actually twisting God and the Bible to mean something different. And Paul would have told you, those people are cowardly for the most part. They're waiting to lure the young and the innocent away from the fold so they can pounce on them with their mockery and their arguments and their intimidation. And our society, which is amoral and a-religious, our society loves tolerant, liberal, sophisticated Christians because with those kind of Christians, that lifestyle doesn't create any conviction. It doesn't break the status quo. It doesn't disturb the comfort zone. And I'm here to tell you this morning that we're not really that kind of Christian. We're the Bible kind of Christian. We're the original kind of Christian. We're called apostolics because we believe in what the apostles taught. And, and, and we believe that Christianity today shouldn't just be something that we kind of salve our conscience with on Sunday. But it should be something that changes us from the inside out and impacts the rest of our life and all of our eternity. That's Christianity. But if you live that way, you're going to run into these people. And especially if you're a new believer here at CCC, uh, sometimes uh, you'll, you'll notice this first and you will be lacerated by some of these people. They won't even feel sorry for doing it. They'll try to make you feel guilty because you live a separated lifestyle to God. They'll try to make you feel like you're really dumb because you accept the Bible at face value. They'll, they'll try to make you feel a little foolish because uh, you actually believe that what God said in Scripture for us to do that we should actually do. And uh, they'll attack you. Um, I was bragging on some of our folks to a group of people this past week um, be, because we've got some new believers that come to CCC and... and uh, 
over the last few years to watch some of them grow. And I was talking about one precious sweet lady that's part of our church family in particular. I didn't call her by name, but I told him her story. She worked with people that went to another kind of church. And uh, those people never bothered much with her. They were okay with her. They were nice to her, but they never bothered a whole lot with her. As long as she was out in the world and she was going to the clubs and the pubs and doing everything that they do. Nobody bothered with her very much until she became an apostolic Christian. And as soon as she became an apostolic Christian and started actually living for God and she shut down all that stuff, these people who were church going people, they never persecuted her when she was in the bar. They never persecuted her when she was going to the pub and the club. They started persecuting her because she was actually going to church and church had made a difference in the way she talked and walked and acted and lived. And all of a sudden, they've got their knives out for her. That's exactly what Paul was talking about when he said, uh, inwardly, they're, they're raven and wolves. Jesus said it, Paul said it, they're gonna be grievous wolves. And, and these people sometimes will go after a young convert and they'll try to uh, mock them because they don't see it the same. And in such an antagonistic atmosphere, sometimes young believers especially, they need an answer for that. What do I say, pastor, when somebody mocks my faith and somebody attacks me for living for God? What do I do when somebody's got all these arguments against the way that I'm living? What do I do and what do I say when, 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 when all these adversaries come against me and I'm not expecting it because I thought, I thought they'd be happy for me? I'm going to church. I'm living for God. I've cleaned up my act. I, I've got rid of sin. I, I, I broke that addiction that I couldn't break, but God broke it for me. And what do I say to all these people? I thought they'd be applauding me and they're attacking me, pastor. They're telling me that's too much. You're over the edge. You've gone over the brink. That's a cult. What do I say? Well, there's one word you can say. And by the way, it will infuriate them. You may find yourself someday at the end of your own intellect trying to defend your faith because some of those people have spent years honing their arguments to a fine edge because they love to attack somebody and get somebody to, to slip down to the status quo where they live. And no matter how bright or how well prepared you are, you might eventually come up against somebody who's brighter and more prepared than you are. But you arm yourself with one word. Wait until they've spent all their energy and wait until they've used all their ammunition and wait until they stand there gloating over you thinking they've won the day. And when they say there, what do you have to say about that? You just say this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. What you say, you may have a point. You might have a good argument. You might have honed that argument to a laser sharp point and you might be attacking the way I live, but here's what you don't know. You don't know me like I know me and you haven't done for me what Jesus has done for me and you didn't break the chains of sin like Jesus broke the chain. So what you say, you may have a point, but nevertheless, the foundation of God stands strong and sure in my life and I am not going back there with you in the name of Christianity. I've already got Jesus in my heart and I'm living for him. I love the word nevertheless. The great prophet Elijah had finished his work and his assistant Elisha somehow sensed in his spirit that God was soon going to take that elder home to heaven and the unknown future hung heavy in the air. You stay here at Gilgal, Elijah said. I'm going to Bethel. And Elisha said to his elder, he said, as the Lord lives, I'm not letting you out of my sight today. And that's the way it went all day. It was like Elijah, the elder prophet, was trying to give Elisha the slip. He went to Gilgal, said, you stay here. He followed him to Gilgal. Then it was Bethel. You stay here, I'm going to Bethel. He went to Bethel. Jericho, you stay here, I'm going to Jericho. He followed him. Finally, they ended up at the Jordan River. And that elder prophet walked up to the waters and snapped his mantle over the water and the river parted and they walked across. And when they got across that river after Elisha has ignored the old prophet saying, you can stay here, he's followed him all day. He's been attached to him all day. He's clung to him like a magnet on steel and, and, and all day long. And finally, when they get across the Jordan River, 
Elijah turns to that young man and he says, we both know what's about to happen. The Lord's about to take me home. So you ask what you will. What do you want me to do for you before I'm taken away? Elisha doesn't have to think about it. He doesn't have to prepare for this. His answer is just as quick. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. And that's when Elijah, the old prophet, looks back at him and he says, you have asked a hard thing. Now that's amazing because this old man has seen a whole lot of things and never once before in all their journeys has Elisha the younger ever heard the old prophet Elijah say, that's hard, never one time. They've seen all kinds of things. A whole army was blinded so they could be delivered. Uh, Elijah has prayed down fire from heaven on a sacrifice. Elijah has held back the rain for over three years with his prayer. It's amazing. Um, he's toppled the house of the wicked king Ahab. Um, he, he's been responsible for killing hundreds of false prophets. And so not one time in all these years has he ever said, that's hard. Blind an army, no problem. Call down fire, no problem. Topple a whole dynasty of King Ahab, no problem. But what you just asked, that's hard. A double portion, that's hard. And he had asked a hard thing. But here's what the old prophet said to him, 2 Kings 2 and 10. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. <laughs> nevertheless, somebody say nevertheless. If you just see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so unto thee. But if you don't see me, it won't be so. And, and so Elisha, that's why he was stuck to that old man like glue. He knew that if he could just stay in the battle and stay in the fight, if he could stay attached to that old prophet long enough, he said, it's hard. God's done so many things, but this, this is really hard. This is above what anybody else has ever asked for. This is above any other miracle that, that I've done or I've been involved in. But if you see me when I go, if you stick with it, if you stay in the battle, if you don't go, uh, turn around and go home, if you see me when I leave, you'll get it. You know, sometimes we think that we're uh, really troubling God by asking him for hard stuff. But, but this is God's attitude expressed through the words of an old prophet. It may be hard. It may be impossible. It may be something that you've never seen God do for anybody else. But if you'll keep in the battle and if you won't turn around and you won't give up and you won't stop praying, you've asked a hard thing. You've asked something See, there's people in here this morning, I know, you've asked something that defies medical science. Medically, it's impossible. Clinically, it's impossible. You've asked a hard thing, but if you'll stay in there and pray, God can do what is impossible. God can overturn the rules of the creation he made. He did it all the time. God invented gravity, but Jesus walked on the waves of the sea and defied gravity. God invented the harvest cycle, but Jesus Jesus could multiply bread out of the palm of his hand. He could let his hand become a bread factory. No growing season, no harvesting, no grinding wheat, no baking it. It was just there. God can overturn the rules of the creation he instituted. And there's somebody in this room this morning and you're praying for a hard thing. And I would just tell you that when the devil attacks your faith and said, that's too hard, that's too big, that's too impossible, you need to say, nevertheless, if I hang in there, God's going to answer me. Nevertheless, if I keep praying, God's going to show up. Years later, that younger man, Elisha, was now old and he was dying on his deathbed. He was visited by a young king named Joash and Joash was terrified of his enemies, the Syrians. And so that old prophet, this is the young man grown up now to be an old prophet, He's had a long ministry and he's had the double portion anointing of Elijah. And that old prophet had that young king shoot an arrow out of the window. He said, this is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. So shoot the arrow. But before he did anything else, he said, I want you to take your quiver of arrows and I want you to smite them on the ground. And, and, and I think that old prophet assumed that the young king would realize I'm the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. I've got the Syrians against me. The prophets give me instruction. I think the old prophet assumed he would get it. 
Because this is the man that years before, he got it. He understood, I've got to attach myself to that old prophet. I've got to go above and beyond what is convenient to get my answer. And I think he assumed that that young king would get it, that this is a, a moment of destiny. And so he said, take your arrows and strike the ground. And that young king gets down and he strikes the ground three times and then he, he looks back at the prophet for further instructions. And that old man on his deathbed, he got so angry. He, he said, don't you understand? That was a prophetic action. Now you're gonna only win three battles over the Syrians. If you'd have kept smiting until I told you to stop, you would have smitten the Syrians until they were totally obliterated. Your enemy was history and you had control of the kingdom. But that young King Joash was like so many modern believers. They don't strike enough. They don't cry and pray and ask big enough. They don't keep at it very long. They pray a couple of times. They come to the altar a couple of times. They seek God for a couple of months and, and then they give up and, and their attitude is, well, I prayed and it didn't work. You don't understand how prayer works. Prayer isn't a one-time push a button, get your money out of the ATM. That's not how prayer works. Prayer works when it keeps at it. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. One translation says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. When it keeps on working, it has great result. You see, what we've got to do is we've got to keep hitting the ground until the deliverance comes. We've got to keep striking the ground until God does what he said he would do. With every great undertaking, if you're praying for something, I, I guarantee you're going to have some Job's comforters come around you and they're going to, in, in great love and affection, they're going to tell you what is impossible. They're going to tell you that what you're doing or praying is impractical or impulsive. They're going to tell you you're just, uh, you know, a little impetuous. They may even tell you you're a little imbecilic. They, 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 they don't know. But they're quick to offer their opinion. There'll always be a Sanballat and Tobiah at your elbow to tell you, you can't build the wall, Nehemiah. Such voices of discouragement, they're a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. You ask Nehemiah, he was a wall builder. But Nehemiah had this perfect answer when they came to him and said, first of all, you can't build this wall. Secondly, uh, the king is gonna hear about this and he's not gonna like that you're rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem and he's gonna come. And, and thirdly, you guys don't know what you're doing. You're not wall builders. If just a little animal ran on this wall, it would knock it down. And in the face of all that, Nehemiah had the perfect answer. Nehemiah 4 verse 9, nevertheless, and we, we heard you. We understand that we're not professional wall builders. We understand there's opposition. We got it. But nevertheless, we made our prayer to God and we set a watch against them day and night because of them. Nehemiah just said, uh, we kept our eye on the negative people. We heard what they said, but we didn't listen to what they said. Nevertheless, we just kept on working and we kept on praying. Nowhere in the Bible are Christians promised a life of ease. In fact, many scriptures like Psalm 34, 19 say exactly the opposite. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. If you think being a Christian is a band-aid for everything that's ever going to go wrong, it's not. You'll still have problems. You'll still have to pay your rent and pay your bills. And you'll still have sickness in your family. And you'll still have kids with runny noses and kids that don't listen. And it's all going to be basically the same, except you're not just bouncing around through this existence and then you're going to die and we'll have your funeral. Everything you do, everything you give, everything you pray, everything you say, it all works into God's eternal kingdom. And you're part of something that's going to outlast your life and go far beyond your death. But we get looking at our problems sometimes and we, we don't think God's very fair. And maybe that's something that you've struggled with. I, I don't know if God's very fair to me. We try to impose on God our limited understanding of fairness. And we quickly find out that God's not going to have anything to do with our sense of fairness. If you uh, go to the supermarket and you're standing in the checkout line and you see a mother of three kids, you know 
that if she's going to buy one a candy bar, she's going to buy all three a candy bar, or she's going to have a riot in the shopping cart. That's fair, right? No, no mother in her right mind would buy two candy bars and give to two of the children. No mother in her right mind would give the candy to one child and tell the other two children, now watch your brother eat his candy bar and rejoice. <laughs> and yet sometimes that's exactly what God does to us. Rejoice with those who rejoice. So I'm sick in body and I'm walking through the darkest time and the worst day of my life and brother so-and-so got this blessing and I'm supposed to rejoice with him. That's precisely what God does. Sometimes he lifts one person to public prominence and bountiful blessing before the eyes of everybody and he lets somebody else pour out their life in obscurity and hardship and suffering. And when you start trying to explain this God that we serve, your little intellect is gonna come up far short of trying to explain his ways and his dealings with us. Sometimes you're going to look at what God has allowed in your life and the devil's going to torment you and other people are going to cast doubt on it and your faith is going to be shaken. You're going to think, I wonder if this is really worth it and I wonder if I'm just imagining all this because I, I thought God gave me this promise but this promise hasn't come true yet and, and your explanation uh, for what's going on is going to come far short of what your faith is trying to pull you to. And you're going to wonder if God really loves you and if God really cares and if God's really aware and if God's even really listening. And it's going to defy your logic and defy your intellect. But there is one word <laughs> that can make sense of it. There is one word that can bring joy and victory no matter how much suffering or blessing your life may contain right now. There is one word. Now, the devil has practiced his arguments for thousands of years. The devil has learned his lines well. He never misses one single opportunity to accuse God. And he'll whisper in your ear, that's your God for you. He lets you work like a slave. He lets you pray without ceasing. He lets you pour out your heart. He lets you give till you drop. And then he rewards you with trial and suffering. That's your God. Do you deny that? Well, how can you deny that? That's the life you're living right now. And the devil will kind of come up to you and say, now what do you have to say to all of that? You prayed and it didn't get answered. You gave and it doesn't seem that you're blessed. Your friends are doing okay, but it seems like right now you're walking through this horrible, deep, dark valley and you don't know the way out. You can't even see the way up and, and it seems totally dark and totally without the sense of God's presence. What do you say to that? Here's what you say. Nevertheless, 2 Timothy 1.12, for the which cause I also suffer these things, Paul said, I'm in prison, Timothy. They're persecuting me. They're lying about me. False brethren are traveling around trying to undo all the work I did for God. Uh, people that I have taught and spent time with and invested my life in, they've turned against me and they're, they're going a different way. But nevertheless, even though I'm suffering, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Let me tell you why I can say nevertheless in the face of all my suffering, Timothy. Let me tell you why my faith is rock solid even when the facts are pounding against me. Here's why. For I know whom I have believed. I know that the God I serve, even though I don't understand him always, I know he's faithful and I know he loves me and I know he has my best interests at heart. So even though I don't understand his dealings, I don't understand his ways, here's what I know. I trust his heart. I trust his character. I trust his faithfulness. I know whom I have believed. I didn't just believe in the stock market. I didn't just believe in some other preacher. I didn't just believe in somebody that gave me some blessing. No, I have believed in God and I know whom I have believed in. And if you know who you're believing in, you can go through a lot of grief. If you know who you're believing in, you can go through some deep, dark valleys. If you know who you're believing in, you can survive the sickness. If you know who you're believing in, you can survive the family trouble. 
I wish somebody would lift up your voice to the Lord and at least give Jesus a praise in the middle of this message because it doesn't matter if we give a religious lecture today, but it does matter if Jesus touches somebody's life. I know who my faith is in. My faith isn't in a denomination or in this church building. My faith isn't in some member of our staff. My faith isn't in some kind of sermon that I heard. My faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ and my faith foundation stands sure. Nevertheless, I've got sickness. Nevertheless, I know whom I believe. I've got trouble. Nevertheless, my God is faithful to me. Paul said, oh, oh, Timothy, one other thing. First of all, here's why I can say nevertheless. I can say nevertheless because I know whom I believe, but here's what else I know. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now, some people read that negatively. They shouldn't. It's like, well, God's keeping all the records. Well, that's kind of scary. Because some of us can't figure out where we put the receipt that we used, we got from Walmart yesterday. You've been looking at it because your wife wants it, you know. But God, he keeps records, immaculate, perfect records of everything. Some people see that very negatively. You know, God's keeping the records. I better be careful. God's keeping the records. He knows every prayer you've prayed. He knows every dollar you've ever given to his kingdom. God knows every sacrifice you've ever made. God's watched you every single second of your life when you've been in worship to him. And so here's what Paul knew. He said, I'm persuaded that this Jesus can keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Nothing I have ever done for God is lost, Timothy. God is the one keeping the records. And down here, it may look like I'm doing this and I'm not receiving a reward. It may look like I'm given and I'm getting nothing back. It may look like I'm praying and no answer is coming. But Timothy, I'll tell you one thing. God is keeping the records and eternity is the great equalizer and I'm not worried about it one little bit because I know whom I believed and I know he's faithful and I know he's keeping good records. He knows the way that I take, Job said, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Jesus gave a command one day to his disciples and it must have seemed like a little bit of mockery. They were exhausted and tired. It was broad daylight on the Sea of Galilee and even a carpenter like Jesus should know that you can't catch fish on the Sea of Galilee in broad, sunny daylight. Furthermore, Peter and the other professional fishermen had labored all night and they'd caught nothing and now they were tired. And now a prophet from a landlocked, i.e. no water, village of Nazareth is spouting off directions to these fishermen as though he knew something about fishing. And Peter has the right to feel tired and he's more than a little frustrated. They've fished all night. They've worked all night in the prime hours for fishing and they've caught nothing. All right. You say it, Jesus, I'll do it. I'm going to prove that you don't know what you're talking about. Sometimes we think that obedience has to be really joyful, you know, that when you obey, you're going to be like floating on cloud nine. Sometimes obedience isn't necessarily joyful. Obedience is just obedience. When you say to your children, don't play on the street, you don't care whether they obey out of joy <laughs> or they just obey. You just want them off the street before they get hit by a car. And God's the same. So Peter said, okay, I'll obey. I'll cast out the nets one more time. But not before I let everybody know it's a stupid idea, Jesus. <laughs> but hey, Mr. Carpenter, talking to the professional fisherman, if you want nets, you'll get nets. They'll be wet and slimy and heavy and they'll still be empty. But in spite of Peter's reluctance, maybe even with a little bit of doubt in his heart, Peter decides to just give up and let God take over. And he does it with one word, Luke 5 and 5. Master, we've toiled all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, that's the facts, Jesus. But if you say that something can happen if we obey, then I'll obey. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. 
And suddenly Peter is totally stunned because not ever in his whole career as a fisherman has he ever taken such a catch, not even in the prime hours of fishing. And sometimes we labor under the idea that our obedience to God needs to make us feel so good. When we're obeying, we're going to feel this, this little buzz of, of, of Christianity, anointing. But that's a little absurd. There may be demands that God places on us that make no more sense than fishing in the broad daylight or whatever else he asked the disciples to do. It's permissible to tell God, Jesus, I don't understand it's permissible to tell God, God, I don't know why you asked this. That's permissible. He already knows you're thinking it. He knows your heart. And he'll let you talk. And he'll listen to all your explanations. And he'll let you tell him why the situation is impossible. And, and, and you need to just talk to God like you talk to anybody else. How ironic that in modern Christendom, we spend so much time talking to each other about things that we already know our friends can't fix. And we spend so little time talking to the only one who can actually fix it. God won't be upset if you talk to him. Let him hear it all. Let him know why it's impossible. I'm sure that the Almighty will appreciate your help. And when you're finished telling God why it makes no sense... And he's still answered with silence and he's still just waiting for you to obey. Be sure you pull this one word into your life. This word, nevertheless. God, I don't understand why you said that, but nevertheless, I'm going to do it. I don't understand why you expect me to keep on praying when it didn't happen and I prayed last week. Nevertheless, I'm going to pray one more time. Here's what we've got to realize, that miraculous, supernatural blessings await exhausted people who've toiled all night and nothing happened and they worked for a long time and nothing uh, came true and they've cast their nets over and over. But just one more time, they're willing to cast that net and obey the Lord. Because what we don't understand about God is that many times in his word, the more unlikely the command is, the greater the miracle is when we obey the command. First comes the nevertheless, and then comes the miracle. So for anybody in here this morning that you're too tired, too young, too old, you're too burdened, you're too imperfect, you're too in, unspiritual, you don't have to be any of those things. You don't have to be rested. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be joyful. You don't have to be any of those things. You just have to be obedient at thy word. Nevertheless, I don't understand it. I don't like it. But nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Paul wrote to the Galatians in 6 and 9 and he said, don't be weary in well-doing. Because in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. There's a lot of people that give up just a few inches short of their miracle. There's a lot of people that do that. Music, come on back if you would. Now, why would I do this for God? Why would I say, okay, nevertheless, God, I don't understand the way you're dealing with me. I don't understand why you've allowed this. Why, why would I give God my nevertheless and say, okay, nevertheless, I, I see the facts, but, but nevertheless, I'm going to stand on my faith. Why would I do that for Jesus? Well, to answer that question, I'd have to take you to a scene that is horrific. I'd have to take you to a night in his life when howling demons are dancing around him in, as he's in agony, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Torturing mental images are ripping at his very soul. He's dreading what's coming. Soon will come the crucifixion that will deliver him to hell at the hands of others. And Jesus looks down at his hands as they claw at the massive rock where he's praying in the garden. Is it raining? No, it, it, it's blood his own dripping blood and it marks the agonizing passing of time as he prays in the garden the clock ticks and the blood drips and his voice quavers and it raises to a, a pitch that sounds more like a wail than a prayer as he prays 
And as Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, the demons are doing their worst. They've shown him all the pain that awaits him. They're trying to make him turn away from the cross. They've displayed for him gleefully the picture in his mind of his naked body hanging cruelly, suspended for all the world to see. They've tormented his imagination with images of hell itself. And, and then the devil plays his trump card. And he shows Jesus the worst thing of all. Worse than the crucifixion. Worse than the agony of the nails. Worse than the crown of thorns. He shows him the trump card. The worst thing of all. He shows him my sin. And you can count on it. The devil is screaming in the ears of Jesus. Would you die for people like that? You would throw your life away for people like that. Dirty people. Perverted people. Sinful, addicted, bound, broken people. But they're not just that, Jesus. They're depraved. They lie and they do black deeds. And really, Jesus, they worship themselves. You guarantee it. The devil paraded all of us before Jesus. And he said, Jesus, there's not one worthy among them for you to die for. Why would you sacrifice your life? It'd be one thing if you were sacrificing yourself for good people, great people, perfect people. The devil parades around Jesus and torments him as he prays. Jesus, to fling your life into the sewer for perverted sinful flesh, to die in the very arms of hell for a degenerate, hell-bent wretch. That's just a reckless waste of your life, Jesus. You guarantee that while Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, the demons are tormenting him and the angels in heaven are horrified because they're watching God robed in flesh about ready to do the unthinkable that he's going to give his sinless life for sinful lives. He's going to give his perfect life for lives that are so very imperfect. He's going to suffer and die so people that aren't even aware of him can live. And as the devil torments and screams and the demons parade around and all these images of torment and hell are thrown at Jesus, he prays, take it away. Father, please don't make me drink this cup. He does, you read your Bible. Jesus prays, I don't want to. It's too much. Please take it away so I don't have to drink it. If you listen really, really carefully on that night, while you hear Jesus wailing and crying and groaning in prayer, if you listen closely enough, you'll hear another prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's hardly audible. It's just a whisper. It's almost drowned out by the howling of the demons and the sobbing of Jesus. But if you could listen really close, you'd hear another prayer. It's our prayer. Jesus, please don't listen to the devil. Please don't ask to be excused from your destiny on the cross. Because Jesus, if this cup passes from your lips, it has to pass to my lips. If this punishment is averted from you, it has to fall on me. And Jesus, if I ever have to drink the cup of all my sin, it's for eternity. The torment is mine for all eternity could listen close enough, you'd hear another little prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane that night. It would be every person in this room that's ever had their sins forgiven. Our prayer was there on that night. Please, Jesus, don't pass on this cup because if you pass on this cup, it's all over for us. Can you imagine the devil parading in front of Jesus that night? Can you imagine the devil bringing before Jesus all the masses of humanity? Look at him, Jesus. You're a fool. Do you really expect that all those people are going to repent and believe and obey and serve you? Most of them will never know you. Many of them will blaspheme your name. 
And for one time in his existence, the devil has told the truth. Many people will blaspheme his name. Most people won't ever serve him. Most people won't even be aware of the price he paid. The devil knows it and Jesus knows it. Most of the human race in 2017 will never be anything but what we are. We won't believe anything but what we want to believe. What a waste that Jesus would go through all that agony. What a waste that Jesus would go to Calvary and die and shed blood and die in torment only to see millions, even billions still cast into hell because they won't come to him for the free salvation that cost him so much. See, in that night, the physical pain awaiting Jesus on the cross, that's the least of his worries and that's the least of his agony. You see, not even for one second has sin ever entered the life of Jesus. But now what he dreads is he knows that on the cross he must become every sin of every sinner. He must become all the sin that the human race has ever committed. And when that happens and the sin of every human descends on him, it will rip his humanity and his deity apart. It'll be such a soul-wrenching agony that he'll cry to heaven, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And even heaven can't comprehend such a sacrifice. And Jesus will die hanging on a cross alone and forsaken. He won't just bear our sin. He became our sin. That had to be the worst fear that Jesus ever felt. But in spite of seeing everything that lay ahead, in spite of knowing that most people would still blaspheme him and they'd never serve him. Most people would never call themselves Christians. In spite of that, on the worst night of his human existence, as he's being tormented by the devil and all his demons, one last time, Jesus lifts up his tired, weary, weeping, agonized voice in Luke 22, 42. Father, if you're willing, please remove this cup from me. I don't want to do this. I'm dreading this. I don't know if I can stand this. Nevertheless, that's the fact. I don't want to go through this. That's the fact. This is the worst thing that will ever happen to me. That's the fact. But I've got something bigger than that fact. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And with that, nevertheless, Jesus turned his face toward Calvary. He walked out of that garden. They arrested him. They took him through six trials that were a mockery of justice. And they nailed him to a cross. And he died crying and bleeding and writhing in pain and agony. And he did it for us. And when Jesus in the garden said, nevertheless, I'll do it regardless, heaven and earth began to rejoice. And all of hell's arguments and accusations were brought to nothing. And the chasm between the horrible truth about all of us and God's mercy, that chasm was bridged. The psalmist said it like this, mercy and truth are met together and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The truth about me keeps me forever out of heaven. But God's mercy picked me up when I was unworthy and it allowed me to be part of his family and it allows me to anticipate living in heaven forever with him. I don't have to wonder if God loves me. I don't have to wonder if God is faithful. I don't have to wonder if God will show himself strong for me or come through for me because God already proved that he loved me unconditionally in the garden of Gethsemane when he said, nevertheless. And my question this morning is this.
after God said nevertheless for us, will we say nevertheless for him? If Jesus could say, nevertheless, I'll still go to the cross, then surely I can say, it's tough right now. Nevertheless, I'm going to keep worshiping God, and I'm going to keep serving God, and I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to be faithful to him the way he's been faithful to me. Last scripture, and we're going to come pray. Psalm 103, verse 10. He has not dealt with us after our sins. Somebody say, I'm thankful. Somebody say, I'm thankful. Somebody say, I'm thankful. Oh, somebody say, I'm thankful. God has not dealt with us after our sins. He has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. He could have. He should have. But he didn't. For as the heaven is high above the earth... That's how great his mercy is toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. Would you stand with me right now in the presence of God? And if you know Jesus, I'm asking you right now, if you would, instead of getting ready to go, you'd get ready to pray and you'd lift your hands right now in God's presence now your hands are important but they're not as important as this next part would you lift your voice in God's presence I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Pastor's preaching this morning to somebody that you just need to pick yourself up and try again. God will help you. You just need to pick yourself up and pray again God will help you you just need to pick yourself up again and point your face in the right direction and keep on walking I know it's hard I know the devil's fighting I know the enemy of your soul has attacked you with doubt and fear anxiety and worry pain and suffering but if Jesus could say nevertheless I'll go through it for them then surely I can say, nevertheless, I'm going to keep on walking for Jesus. Nevertheless. just leave where you're standing as a family of God and would you proceed to the front this morning pastor's not going to take time to call a few and call some first and call some later I'm just asking everybody that's grateful for Jesus and what he's done you need a touch of God in your life I'm going to ask you if you'd leave where you're standing and make your way to this altar everybody's welcome everybody included nobody excluded I know I'm talking to some people this morning that you don't understand. I can't fix your understanding. 
I know I'm talking to people that are in personal pain. I can't fix your pain. But here's what I can do. I can point you to Jesus. And if you'll reach out to Jesus, and if you'll keep walking with Jesus, he will see you through. Would you lift your hands? Let's pray, church. Go ahead and sing, praise team. Let's let them sing, but let's pray. Would you lift up your hands and pray right now? God, I don't understand, but I'm going to be faithful. God, I don't understand, but nevertheless, my foundation is sure.